from the Computer Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015, brought to you by Mirantis. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Brick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Silicon Valley. This is the Cube, our flagship program from Silicon Angle Media, where we go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined with Jeff Frick, general manager of our Cube business. Our next guest is Nettie Shalom, CTO founder at Gigaspaces. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you very much. So we're here in OpenStack in Silicon Valley. You guys have an uh, office in Israel, New York, and here in the Valley. Um, so I got to ask you, OpenStack, ready for prime time? Are people using it for mission critical? Uh, infrastructure, what are you guys doing? How do you see all this shaking out? <laughs> okay, so that's a... <laughs> Trick question, right out yeah, of the back. Yeah, yeah. Right so, uh, the first answer is hell yeah, it is ready for enterprises, but it comes with its uh, cost and price and challenges and all those type of things. Actually, I had a, a podcast uh, last week around that, uh, if OpenStack is ready for enterprises, and we had a, a talk with Lorraine from Forrester where we actually analyzed that question and tried to put more color into it. Uh, so the reality is that I think uh, the main blocker for OpenStack to be more, more well adopted within OpenStack is obviously the complexity of the infrastructure itself, a lot of moving parts, a lot, a lot of knobs to, to fix. I think there are a couple of approaches to solve that. Uh, Randy Bias actually we did a, a nice interesting comment yesterday is that we all want to be avoid the lock-in and therefore we want the options, but we don't understand that with that comes the price. And actually, the, probably the best approach is to use appliances or prepackaged type of solutions. And what I'm seeing other companies are doing today, like Rackspace and IBM and other private hosted kind of models in which someone outsource the problem to someone else who has the expertise and deal with that. So I think that if I look at what's happening in OpenStack right now, there is a lot of evolution to create those choices, not just take OpenStack from open source and build it, because most people don't have the skill set, nor do it make sense for them to do that but actually take it in a prepackaged model, outsource model, outsource to the public, outsource to private host, all those type of things. This is going to be, in my view, critical to the adoption and success of OpenStack in the enterprise right now. Especially since the catalyst of the whole thing was AWS in the first place, exactly. right? Dial it up, drop your credit card in, and you've got, you've got compute power. You think that that would really be a driver to get OpenStack, you know, it's never going to be quite that simple, but really be driving hard towards that, that direction. I think that's the only solution, in my view not just installers where I think the primary focus has been, but really create that uh, installed version, but appliances, private hosted, as well as public. And uh, actually for smaller companies to consume OpenStack, public would probably be the only option for enterprises that are mid-sized, uh, the private hosted would be the, only, the main options, and only the big ones that have a lot of engineering forces would actually do the, uh, the other ones, but those are just few. There's a lot of engineering involved in DevOps, right? DevOps is a great thing, we love it. Agile, yeah. you know, you chip in code. We just shipped some new code this morning for one of our DevOps projects. And it's a great ethos, we can't, can't deny that. Yeah. However, most customers have a lot of old stuff. They have servers, they have storage, and a lot of stuff's been happening over the past, say, six to seven, eight years in memory, flash, converged, hyper-converged infrastructure, seeing VMware out there in a lot of the enterprises. So complexity is there but the price is also going to be associated, as you mentioned. But there are economic advantages. Can you share your, your thoughts and uh, opinion on some of those dynamics? How do you balance the innovation on the infrastructure side under the hood? That's, that uh, people that, are building internally uh, and then now layer, oh, Kubernetes, and containers, oh, it's great, love and peace. But at the end of the day, there's realities. Yeah, What's so your take that's on a, that? That's an excellent segue to something that I've been pitching quite a bit for a long time, uh, which I'm quoting, the only constant is change. And uh, I think it shifts the way of thinking on how we uh, deal with that type of reality. So we need to accept the reality that the only constant is change. That we're going to have new tooling, we're still going to have, especially from an enterprise legacy system, and they're not going to go away that quickly. And we're going to have the next big thing that is coming and actually coming faster than it used to be. So from an enterprise perspective, the problem becomes even bigger because this environment is going to be more and more heterogeneous. You would not be able to see an enterprise saying today, I'm a VMware shop, or I'm an Oracle shop, or I'm something shop, because it's actually going to have everything in its tool chain, if he wants it or not, because that's the uh, thing for innovation. That, in my view, shift the value, and as well as the problem, to more of an integration problem than it used to be. 
So we cannot expect from a vendor to come with the analytics solutions like we use with Tivoli and IBM and other things. Okay, let's outsource I'm your that guy, problem. Yeah. yeah, I'm your guy. Yeah. He's going to figure out how to do all those things for us and we'll buy it from someone else and he's going to give us a prepackaged solution for everything and now it works. That's not going to work because obviously that yeah. vendor would, one, lock you in. Second, he's not going to be able to embrace that change himself. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so I think that right now the main challenge is how do you integrate all that? How do you create a, an integration tool? With existing stuff and new stuff. Exactly, that, that, that you could yourself, without being dependent on a vendor, plug in those new stuff, but it would look from an end user perspective from the users that need to consume those stuff as a holistic solution, as if it was pre-integrated. And that's something that, for yeah. example, we're focusing on. You mentioned appliances rating. earlier in your yeah. early comment. Okay, that was, people were against the appliance. Exactly. Oh, I don't want another box. It was kind of like, you know, sprawl, that conversation around server sprawl, going back, you know, a decade ago. Consolidation, virtualization certainly changed that game. But now you're seeing the trend tip back to, as Oracle says, engineered systems. So, yes. actually not a bad thing. I can plug something in, it works. My iPhone works. Android kind of flakes out a little bit here. But you know that's kind of the mode, this iPhone kind of mentality where, hey, I want to drop something in. I want a bullet, I want an SLA, I want the scale. I don't really care it's in a box. That's what customers, we hear from customers. Do you yeah. agree uh, with that, that how I do they manage that, that? The reason why people were uh, scared away from appliances is because of the locking concern. But if the appliance itself takes an open technology and prepackage it for me and do the same thing that I could do myself, then there is no harm doing it because why? what value would you get to do it yourself? Actually, no value. Um, and I think that's that's the balance, and I think yeah. as long as we get appliances that relies on open technologies and do the same thing that we could do ourselves, as long as we keep in that line, then there's nothing wrong in appliances, yeah. and that mind, that mindset needs to, ch to change. That mi yeah. negative mindset was a fun need to change. You know, that. I want to get your thoughts on this because it's a great conversation because this is kind of like a, no one really talks about it in public yeah. because it's hard to articulate, but back in the old days of software, they had the Intel processor that was a hardened top. A lot of proprietary yeah. stuff and a processor, yeah. but no one really cared because it worked. So back to the kind of engineered systems, and this middleware battle going on, call it pass, call it middleware abstraction layer, containers, DevOps, that's a big focus, this new middleware markets are evolving. So the question for you is, where's the hardened top? Where's the line where it doesn't matter, it works? Is it, for, is it the infrastructure? Is it where in the stack? Or can you add some commentary to that or insight? Yeah. So, so obviously I have an opinion about that uh, and, and I'm biased towards the approach that we've taken, but in generally I think that the underlying infrastructure itself and tooling is going to keep on changing very fast. The thing that changed less is the application that we consume and use, and uh, and the thing that changes is how do we run it, where do we run it, how effective it is, and we also want to be able to be able to push into those application uh, the new features that we want to do. But that's a layer that we usually control, and that's something that we can embed and, and embrace. So the layer of complexity are the things that we don't control, and usually that's, that's in the infrastructure layer. And therefore, I think that the right level of abstraction is really uh, closer to the application rather than in the lower level of the infrastructure because that's going to keep on changing and moving and be disrupted quite significantly. And we want to keep it as close to the application, which is a layer that we can control. So if we put the, the abstraction at that layer, our ability to actually create, if you like, a shock observer between all the things that are moving and the things that we control, then the chances that it will be sustainable and stable over yeah. time is much higher than if we try to put the abstraction in at the infrastructure level, at the storage right. level, at the network level, all those stuff. So, that, that, so that, if you believe that to be true, which I like that idea, let's just play with that idea, the opportunity is pretty large, right, for people, especially in the software business. Yep. What kinds of opportunities are out there for other entrepreneurs, other companies to innovate? Because if you assume there's a lot of change going on in the underlying infrastructure, and we're seeing things with Flash and whatnot. Yeah, so my, I'm, I mean, I'm inspired from the movie Hair, have you seen the movie Hair? H-E-R? Yeah, yeah, uh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, X uh, Machina? I'm not sure if you've seen yeah, yeah, X yeah. Machina? Yes, yeah, so, yeah. so if you look at that, I think that's where the next wave of things is going to push forward, which is combining BI, intelligent, uh, and all those type of things into infrastructure and orchestration, which in my view is the body and the brain. Uh, so right now the body is built separately and the brain is built separately as we as human are mediator between the two things and plug them together. So we need to see what the infrastructure speed out, yeah. and then say, okay, now you do this, move your hands here, move your hands here, which is kind of broken if you think about it. Yeah. So the main point of innovation is how to glue those two things together to create this uh, 
what I would call a software-defined operator, yeah, which yeah. basically means robots. It's very similar to what we're seeing right now with uh, with uh, self-driven cars, uh, yeah. autonomous cars, if you like, uh, where we used to, as humans, yeah. either hold the driving thing, yeah. but we know that uh, as drivers we're not that good and we make a lot of accidents, and, and those are areas in which you could innovate yeah. quite a bit. And I think that's the main area of innovation. How do we take a lot of that manual work, a lot of those things that are fairly complex, get put the robots inside and get them to be I think that's great innovated. insight. I mean, I think if you look at how people would take a, an approach to a market, they oh, here's my silo. I build this software stack and it's a siloed. But what cloud has really shown us is it's horizontally scalable, right? So exactly. like, that's a beautiful thing. That could be the head, right? Yep. So if I've got an app on a self-driving car, you can have Intel processors and all that stuff in there. The software's going to run on a self-driving car, my watch, data center. So this interoperability concept is not just about interoperability, it's functionality too. Exactly. So, so exactly. It really it's vertically oriented stacks with a horizontally scalable. Do you? Is that kind of Mike getting that right, or? Yeah, yeah, because it does uh, drive the focus. I mean, we're all talking about speed, right? That the focus needs to be on speed of how ma how fast we can roll out new uh, features, new yeah. applications to be more competitive. Again, similar to what Ford did when he rolled out Model T. If yeah. you think about what he did there back then, we used to build custom cars before that, and we were very proud about that. And then Ford came in and he said, you could choose any color as long as it's black, and shifted all the thinking. Yeah. Um, when you scale, you have to think of how fast you could roll out things, not how special they are. And we're going to the same point with yeah. IT industry. We were building data centers by hand, and now we're changing the focus on how fast we can roll out things, and all of a sudden, being special is actually a barrier. Uh, so if people have, if there's going to be no winners, basically, coexistent model means there's no winners. I mean, there'll be a bigger winner than other winners, but if you have a lot of things going on in an enterprise, they vertically integrated, horizontally scalable, that speaks to the trend of purpose-built stacks, you got Oracle, you see VMware and EMC, that whole conversation, mm -hmm. that could go end-to-end. -end. So this notion of end-to-end, -end, data center to the car, to the edge, yep. um, has to be not monolithic one vendor, has to be multiple vendors. It, by definition. So, so how does OpenStack win there, right? Because that's really, I'm trying to see that. I just, I'm not seeing how OpenStack can be an end-to-end -end winner with all the agendas. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a gap that I think exists right now in OpenStack. If you, that's the paradox I was writing about, the OpenStack paradox, interoperability paradox. That's exactly that thing that I saw as well. Did you publish that? Yeah, I just it's published it uh, yesterday, I think. Okay, on your blog, company yeah, blog? Yeah, on okay. your company blog, uh, which touches exactly on that. When people buy into OpenStack, it's for that interoperability, but the reality is that they cannot use OpenStack for interoperability because it was really built to be a clone of Amazon on a private cloud and there is almost zero focus on interoperability. That, that is changing, but I think yeah. right now uh, it's the ecosystem who solved that problem. And I think uh, there is a lot of solutions now around yeah. OpenStack to solve that problem, including what we're doing. Uh, but I think the focus on OpenStack should change from how do we build the next Amazon to how we build OpenStack so that it could run on, on VMware, so that it could run, uh, which actually does that already, but could also run on Azure and Google, and those type of areas. I think that's the area in which OpenStack will thrive and be much more successful than if we take OpenStack and build the best storage and the best network or the best whatever. Uh, so if I think about the two scenarios, OpenStack now runs as the infrastructure, or the, at least as the abstraction across all those clouds versus it builds the greatest uh, compute or storage which one are better? So OpenStack is at a inflection point then right now. I believe so, yes. And so it's like a moving train, it's like shooting it a moving train, it right? Is. It is, And the $100 million of Neurantis, I think, uh, was really targeted to solve some of that change and at least bet on one company to strive that because I think you need the powerhouse of developers to focus only on that to actually drive that because the rest of the ecosystem, I think, is less, if you'd like, uh, focused on solving that problem. So I think that's a good news. Uh, in this event, and I believe we'll see a change as a result of that. Final question for you, is there a hybrid cloud? Does it exist, is it a category? I mean, you got public cloud, you got Amazon, you mentioned that, private cloud, we're seeing that, those are tangible solutions people are deploying. Um, I mean, hybrid cloud, does it exist? Is it like, do I buy hybrid cloud? Is it just an outcome of deployment? So, so I, I, the answer is yes. It exists by definition, even if you look at the organization, you'll see that some things they run on Amazon, but some things they still don't run on Amazon. But it's not uh, a solution, an integrated solution. It's a reality, but no one figured out how to make that reality a cohesive experience, integrated product, or whatever. 
Uh, and again, if you look at uh, in any enterprise, you'll find them using not just Amazon, they will be using something else as well. And they will be using VMware as well, and we'll still be using VMware. So hybrid exists, it's just not there as a solution, not as an architecture, not as a product. And I think that's kind of the gap that we're it's talking about. It's kind of like about. distributed computing, it's, just, it's out exactly. there. Exactly, by definition. I mean, you're using uh, iPhone, but in your organization, they would be using Android as well and some other things. So by definition, it's going to be even more and more hybrid it's just that we haven't figured out how to make it a, a cohesive architecture, that hybrid approach. Uh, that awesome, thanks for your insight. Really appreciate you taking the time coming on Natty, the CTO of GigaSpace's founder, uh, doing business and mission critical applications in the cloud. Obviously, the hard and top is close to the applications. Everyone's going to be winning to what level. We'll be following that here in theCUBE. We'll be right back live in Silicon Valley after this short break. <laughs>